is Ryan Miller, and for the past 15 years, I've helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you, too, can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. I could get in trouble for telling you this, but I'm going to do it anyway. What's the cause of inflation and how do you profit from it? Well, my next guest is about to teach you how to protect and profit from inflation using the right combination of digital assets. All this and more coming right now. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Anthony Fernandez. Anthony is the head of business development at a crypto firm known as Economy. He and his team manage over 120 million AUM with a rich background in asset management, foreign exchange, and cryptocurrency mining and trading, Anthony has become a leading authority in blockchain technology, including DeFi, derivatives, trading, and cross-chain solutions. So what this means is that Anthony understands how to make money in the crypto space and is about to teach you and I how to do the same. So Anthony, welcome to the show, man. Ryan, I really appreciate you having me to the show. I've, I've listened to a number of your podcasts, you know, the, recently the one with uh, Kevin Deramitz with, you know, talking about gold and inflation. It really resonated well with me coming from the Bitcoin industry a lot of similarities between uh, yeah, Bitcoin and gold. Feel a bit of imposter syndrome. You've had such high caliber guests on the show. So hopefully I can provide some uh, some value uh, to the level of their, their, their content. You know what? You're very kind. And we've been fortunate enough to be rated in the top 2% in the world of all podcasts. And it's all because of amazing guests like you, Anthony. So we really appreciate you being here. We're excited to crack this open and really learn more about making money in the crypto space and billionaire cheat codes and everything that you and your team have put together. Now, before I do, before we get into that, maybe you can just open up what is economy and tell us a little bit about what you do there, and then we'll get on to beginner advice. Yeah, good question. So, you know, economy, we are classed as a cryptocurrency exchange, but the, what, what we actually really do is we help investors uh, access a range of digital asset portfolios that have consistently outperformed the market over the past five to six years. So whether, you know, they're beginner investors or more high net worth, sophisticated investors, we have a range of portfolios from index, quant, algorithmic, discretionary managed portfolios for investors to potentially utilize across the market. Yeah, I love that. So now as we move on and we're talking about crypto and we're looking into all these things, maybe we can just talk to the beginners who are looking at crypto, making trades, just understanding this market. Two questions for you, Anthony. Number one, how does a beginner who's starting out, how do they win? How do they get early points on the board? And then maybe we'll follow up with how do they not lose and make those silly mistakes that beginners make? So how does beginner win? It, it sounds like such a simple, simple question. And uh, to be honest, it has a, a relatively simple answer attached to it as well, but it, be, it becomes overcomplicated. You know, where I've had a lot of success and where a lot of investors I work with have a lot of success is building a foundational portfolio, focusing on the top 10 tokens in the market to start with. You know, the cryptocurrency market is highly volatile. You don't necessarily need to be going down to the top 50 tokens, top 100 tokens to generate a return on investment. So, you know, my number one piece of advice would be to build a core holding in the top 10 tokens, so like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and so on and so forth, and using a dollar cost averaging strategy to actually invest into those tokens. And a dollar cost averaging strategy is almost like an automated strategy to invest a set amount into a particular asset on a consistent basis. So what you're essentially doing is you could be purchasing Bitcoin weekly, daily, monthly, or quarterly, no matter what the price point is. So if the market is higher or lower, that's really irrelevant. You're still going to buy the same amount that time. And if you, you, know, if you look out over a year or over two years, what you've essentially done is you've smoothed out your investments into a particular asset. You know, Rather than chasing the highs and chasing the lows and, and thinking whether you should invest at any set time uh, in, in the market, you're automating your investment strategy. Similar to what you know miners do, you think about a cryptocurrency miner, they're accumulating cryptocurrency every single day, no matter what the price is. And they become very successful over the longer term because they hold on to their assets and accumulate daily. If you can take more of an automated approach to your investing over a year and two years, that really compounds your investment and, and makes you become a lot more successful. Yeah, brilliant. And with that, how do they not lose? How do they avoid? So we got dollar cost averaging, just really it's a disciplined approach to say if you're quarterly, daily, whatever that is, stick with it and price will will fluctuate. But over time, that pricing will work out well in your favor. And they look at those in stocks too. So dollar cost averaging is pretty well known strategy and, and quite effective. Now, you can make mistakes in the early days. How does a beginner who's starting out looking to make some money or hedge against inflation, any of that stuff, 
How do they avoid making silly mistakes? What would you say? You know, uh, from my time trading the markets, I've done FX, all kind of different asset classes through to crypto. You know, the number one reason why beginner investors lose is because they move on to derivatives, futures where leverage is involved. And if you put the cryptocurrency market, which is highly volatile, and pair that with leverage trading, it does become a recipe for disaster for beginner investors. You know, for for example, if you're investing, you know, a thousand dollars and you're using leverage and you're, you're leveraged up ten times or a hundred times, and the market moves against you a fraction, that that's you out of the market. And the number one rule is don't lose money, and that's you kind of out the market already in one position. Just this week, Bitcoin dropped ten thousand dollars in one day, and then moved straight back up the following day. Essentially, that's taking out all of the leveraged players in the market uh, and the you know the buyers in the market. So. Number one rule, I would say with crypto specifically, there definitely is a space for leverage trading, but not necessarily with crypto. There are 90% of retail investors lose 90% of their money in 90 days. And that's predominantly through leverage trading in the cryptocurrency market. Mm, so stay away. Uh, I think it was, was it Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger it said the the three things that kill business are ladies, liquor and leverage. I don't know if that, that was a real thing, but you're absolutely right. On the third L, uh, leverage can really tank a great motivated investor. You can have a great strategy. But if that strategy includes leverage or things that you don't understand, I think what Anthony's saying is just stick to the basics and allow those to give you that steady dollar cost averaging profits. Would you agree? It, it sounds too simple, but it's really the most successful strategy I've implemented over the past you know, five to six years in the cryptocurrency market. And, and it's worked well for me. And the clients that I manage, it also works well for them as well. So it sounds simple, but it's the most effective strategy so far. I love it. So now let's move on to the market. What are you seeing out there? How is the market doing? And uh, maybe we'll get on to where you think it's going. So what are you seeing out there? Thank you for watching. If you've made it this far, we must be friends. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that notification button. Now let's get back to the show. So what are you seeing out there? Really, um, I mean, this podcast has come at a very interesting point in time. Uh, We've just had the Bitcoin spot ETFs go live in January. So we've had a month and a half's worth of trading. We have the Bitcoin halving event coming up in April in roughly 40 days. And that's where the rewards that Bitcoin miners received get cut in half. Now, this is going to be the first halving event. You know, the halvings take place every four years. This is the first halving event where Bitcoin is already trading at record highs. So this week, uh, just now, Bitcoin's reached 68, 69,000 US dollars. We're at record highs. And this is being driven mainly by the Bitcoin spot ETFs. So I have a, a really, uh, some powerful sh- uh, slides to share with, with you, Ryan, and, and your audience. Yeah, please. You know, when we look at the uh, Bitcoin ETFs, why are they such a big deal? And if we go back in history and just understand what a spot ETF actually does, a spot ETF, they actually have to go out and purchase the underlying asset from the open market. And if we take a look at what happened to gold back in 2003, 2004, the first gold spot ETF went live. When that went live, uh, gold actually did a 4x in its price and it added 9 trillion in the market gap. Now, if we actually take a look at Bitcoin in particular, Bitcoin has a halving event in April. And because Bitcoin is also a scarce asset, asset, there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin as a finite supply. Bitcoin is actually going to have um, a stock to flow ratio of 120 making this particular asset twice as scarce as gold. Now, you can see the chart there looks very extreme. Uh, We've had a a huge run uh, where investors are now looking to invest in a gold ETF. And we're starting to see this play out with the Bitcoin spot ETF as well. We were speaking earlier in the week, Ryan, and there was around 7 billion, north of 7 billion that's flowed into the Bitcoin ETFs already. I checked today and that number is now north of 10 billion US dollars. So we're seeing in just under two months already $10 billion has flowed into the Bitcoin spot ETFs. And Bitcoin's gone from roughly 35, 36,000 when they went live. It's now trading double, you know, nearly uh, 69,000. So, you know, the price action is running higher and it's because the demand is so high with these ETFs. And whilst the inflows remain strong, we're seeing roughly five to 6,000 new Bitcoin being purchased daily by these ETFs, I can't necessarily see the price action slowing down just yet. So in terms of where we're going to be going, it's going to be a very interesting one, but it also depends on how the market acts after the next Bitcoin halving event. And this really kind of puts into context the Bitcoin halving event. So we've had three halving events previously where the block rewards are cut in half. We can see in 2012, where it went down, uh, where the block rewards were reduced from 50 Bitcoin per block down to 25. We had a major bull market going into 2014. Another halving in 2016, where the block rewards went down from 25, 12.5. Another major bull market into 2018. The third halving in 2020, 
with the block rewards reduced from 12.5 down to 6.25, another major bull market into 21 and 2022, we're now about to have the fourth halving event. And the halving event has historically marked the start of a new bull market. So, you know, we're already at record highs, you know, a month before the next bull market cycle. So it's very interesting how this is going to play out. It's it's kind of different to the previous bull market cycles because we're already at record highs. And to put things into context, uh, Ryan, this really kind of displays how early we are in Bitcoin's cycle. So there's going to be a total of 32 halving events. The last halving event won't occur until the year 2136, unfortunately, out of our lifetime. So, you know, we're, we're coming up to the fourth halving event. There's going to be a total of 32s. Uh, 32, but also paired with the fact that we have these ETFs now purchasing roughly 5,000 to 6,000 new Bitcoin per day in the ETFs. And there's only 900 Bitcoin going into the market per day at the moment. So there's a major supply and demand issue taking place in the digital asset market, specifically with Bitcoin. And this is probably my favorite chart. Uh, This is a spiral chart. So instead of looking at Bitcoin in terms of time uh, against price, We're looking at Bitcoin in terms of blocks mined against price. So Bitcoin actually has a four-year cycle. So when you said, you know, where do we see Bitcoin going and the digital asset market going, I don't like to be emotional about uh, investing in the cryptocurrency market. I like to use previous bull and bear market data to form market averages. And what we can actually see, if you break down the the previous cycles, the, the white dots actually represent each halving event that Bitcoin's had. The green dots represent the bull market peaks. And the red dots represent the bear market lows. And what we can actually understand is that all of the three previous bull market peaks have occurred in the second year post a halving event. So if we use this as an average to to form an investment strategy, it would indicate that, you know, the middle to end of 2025 will potentially be the next bull market peak based on the previous market cycles. Following on from that, the bear market low will, you know, generally comes one year after a bull market peak. So you know, 2026 might be a negative year for digital assets, but based on the previous history, we're expecting a strong performance throughout 24 and early 2025, at least. All right. Well, brilliant, man. So within two years of your having event in Bitcoin, that's a place where we start to make a nice cycle. So you have a nice two year run. So it sounds like because I'm listening to you, I was like, well, I need to buy Bitcoin uh, right after that having event. We can have a nice run on that. Is that kind of what, what your opinion is? Yeah, I mean, based on the previous cycles, it would say that we should have at least a year and a half worth of a positive run over, you know, 24, early 25. Of course, every cycle is going to be different based on liquidity coming into the market uh, and based on the macroeconomics, you know, central bank liquidity and so on and so forth. So, yeah, expecting a positive run over the next year to year and a half. We are a record highs already, which hasn't happened before a halving event. So that dollar cost averaging strategy is really going to come into, in, you know, into effect over the next year or so, because buying frequently um, should help you kind of accumulate at different price points over the next year. Okay. And what have you seen out there with Ethereum? That's another popular currency. I know a lot of people like that. In the early days, that was also impressive. Um, those are kind of the, the gold and silver sometimes uh, of the digital asset space. I'm curious, what, what are you seeing with Ethereum? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, you know, this year in particular, Ethereum has performed very well. Now, if we just go back a year and, and look at 2023, Ethereum only actually received $15 million worth of inflows throughout the whole of 2023, which is minuscule considering Ethereum is the second largest uh, digital asset in the market. Now, if we actually fast forward to today, Ethereum has actually received this year so from the start of the year to you know early March, it's already received $137 million worth of inflows. So it's nearly 10x the entire 2023 in terms of inflows. And why are we seeing this? We're seeing this because investors are now anticipating that there's going to be an Ethereum spot ETF. So there's applications in with the SEC, and investors are now looking to front run that particular application. So the deadline for the SEC is actually in May. So we're starting now to see institutional investors at the high level starting to rotate into Ethereum. And over the last month alone, Ethereum is up roughly 35 to 40 percent. So it's very it's very interesting that we see Ethereum coming, um, catching up to Bitcoin. It really lagged throughout 2023. But now in 24, we're starting to see it catch up with the rest of the market. So this is actually one of my biggest plays at the moment. Last year, it was Solana. Solana was up over a thousand percent and it received over 150 million of inflows at the institutional level. We're now starting to see some profit taking coming out of Solana and that money or appears you know, that liquidity appears to be moving into Ethereum now. Brilliant. And what does that do for liquidity? 
Stay with us. We'll be right back. AI is changing the game of business. Will you be on the winning team? I'm Jordan Wilson, the host of the Everyday AI podcast and your coach to help you learn the X's and O's of AI. Artificial intelligence isn't just a new player in the game, it's a new sport altogether. So if you don't quickly put AI into play, your competitors will run up the score. I've spent my whole life building winning teams, from coaching basketball to working with big players like Nike and Jordan Brand. My next move, helping you win with Everyday AI. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or on everydayaipodcast.com. Let's tap into AI together and put points on the board. In terms of the the, uh, the liquidity coming into the market, it is great for price action. So, you know, if, when you're looking at where to potentially invest your money, you know, you can do all the technical analysis you, you want, but if you don't have liquidity going into a particular asset, it, it simply may not go anywhere. So for myself, what I do, I, I follow liquidity every week. I'm on the CoinShares website, looking at the institutional inflows into different assets across the top 10, top 15 tokens. And I'm generally basing my investment philosophy around where the smart money appears to be going. So I'm generally following the liquidity at the moment is going into assets, predominantly Bitcoin and Ethereum at the moment. Um, there's a few you know, shoots of liquidity going into Chainlink, XRP, Cardano, but nothing at the level of Ethereum and Bitcoin just yet. Okay, brilliant. As we round third base, maybe let's talk a little bit about through all of your experience and everything that you've done, let's talk about some of the deep competitive advantages. So let's cut through the noise, go right to the signal. What are some competitive advantages that you can provide for our listeners in this space? I think it's mainly uh, understanding what Bitcoin actually is. You know, some people you know, have heard a number of different terms being used. Is it a hedge against inflation? Is it a hedge against economic uncertainty? A hedge against government overreach? And I guess, is it a store of value? I guess it's all of the above, uh, potentially. And the, kind of the main driving point of Bitcoin is it's a hedge against fiat currency devaluation. And when you understand that central banks are consistently devaluing their currency and debasing their currency, you'll understand Bitcoin's position in the world. And there is a a really uh, interesting chart of Bitcoin plotted against the world M2 growth rate. So the M2 growth rate of the Fed, the ECB, the PBOC, the the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England. And essentially what this indicates is the, the, the percentage of increase or decrease of the M2 money supply around the world. And what we can actually see here is all of the Bitcoin bear market lows inside with the lows of the M2 growth rate of the central banks. Now, why does a central bank print money to stimulate the economy, uh, to provide financial support? But essentially what that does is later on down the line, it creates inflation and it devalues the local currency. Look what's happening in Argentina, in Turkey, in places kind of slightly outside the West, uh, a bit further away from home. But even if you look at Europe, the UK, in, in the US as well, fiat currencies historically over time devalue based on new liquidity going into the market and printing money out of thin air. Now, Bitcoin actually acts as a hedge against a devaluing currency. So the, the bull market peaks of Bitcoin also coincide when the central banks are looking to reduce liquidity. So that's strengthening the local currency. And vice versa, a bear market low on Bitcoin also coincides with the lows of the growth rate and when central banks are looking to increase liquidity into the system as well. So you know, if you're sitting on a stockpile of cash in, in the bank, uh, which becomes uh, you know, gradually worthless over time, Bitcoin acts as a hedge against that fiat currency devaluation. And I, you know, I know the adoption rate is growing at the moment. I've been in the market for you know, a number of years. I also think it's kind of crazy for, for a person not to have any exposure to this particular asset especially if they own assets like gold, which acts as a store of value as well. We're now starting to see some liquidity flow out of the gold market and into the Bitcoin market. Wow. So governments print money, inflation is the result, and which reduces the purchasing power. So it takes more dollars to buy the same thing. And what I think you're saying is based on that activity, which is economics 101, right? Inflation happens when governments print money. Uh, You can say, however, to hedge against that, to protect your purchasing power, Bitcoin has quantifiable data that shows that it moves directly in line with that. And so the M2 money supply, you can look that up, folks. If you don't know what that is, you can look up what is uh, used to calculate the M2 money supply. Whatever that is, uh, you'll find out that Bitcoin is a good protector against the damaging inflation to your purchasing power. Would you agree? You, You summed it up very well. Ryan, so yes, exactly right. You know, Bitcoin protects your capital rather than being 100% allocated to cash which traditionally devalues, Bitcoin provides that hedge against the devaluation. 
and potentially provide some upside in the market as well. Yeah, brilliant. What other competitive advantage can you provide? Because I know there's like, for example, there's a lot, there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions on a lot of things in the crypto space. How have you managed to deal with that? And what can our, our friends around the world learn? Yeah, definitely. You know, there's so many different analysts, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, I think when you're investing in the cryptocurrency market, I try to eliminate as much noise as possible and just go back to what the charts are telling me, you know, what the Bitcoin spiral chart is telling me. You know, based on that Bitcoin spiral chart, I potentially know when I should be reducing my exposure to digital assets and when I should be increasing my exposure to digital assets. But if you looked at the news, you know, the news would be telling you to buy Bitcoin during the peaks and sell Bitcoin during the lows. So eliminating a lot of the the media, the noise from your investment philosophy and your investment strategy and being consistent over a few years is really a way to become successful. So, you know, Going back to the spiral chart, that's my number one chart. It's also a really interesting chart based on the US dollar index. And this is kind of one of my go-to positions as well. So what is the US dollar index? The US dollar index, the DXY, is a chart of the US dollar as an index, as a standalone. Okay. Now what we can do, we can actually plot all of the Bitcoin bear market lows alongside uh, the DXY bull market peaks. And on the other hand, you can also plot the Bitcoin uh, bull market peaks which coincide with a DXY, so a US dollar bear market low. Now, what moves the US dollar? So the US dollar is a global reserve currency at the moment. Generally, when the dollar is strengthening, it's a risk off market sentiment. So that's where investors are looking to take less risk. They're moving into the global reserve currency. When the US dollar is weakening, it indicates that investors are moving out, or sorry, uh, out of the US dollar and back into risk assets like digital assets, equities, and commodities. So the dollar index is, for me, is a volatility index. And when we're looking at the, you know, the, the macro side of things, understanding what the central bank, the Federal Reserve is going to do in the future. So the last year, you know, there's been cooling interest. They've decided to you know, hold interest rates. There's a lot of forecasts now they're going to be cutting interest rates in 2024 and providing some support to the financial markets. So the US dollar has eased from its peaks and risk assets like the S&P 500, like Bitcoin and gold are now trading at record highs. So it's a kind of a forward looking indicator. And when you use the DXY, technically, and if you understand whether it's going to be strengthening or weakening based on the macro side of things, that can help you form a philosophy in the digital asset market or in the uh, equity market as well. So this is kind of one of my go-to charts, looking at the DXY and trying to understand its next move in the market. Brilliant. So that would be your third one. So second was avoid the noise. So follow the trend lines, not the headlines. And the third one is follow the DXY to BTC to get some pricing action and, and use the, the technicals. Is that right? Yeah. I kind of ran uh, two into one there. So yeah, that would be, uh, that would be my uh, two points most certainly. Brilliant. Yeah, we're just overflowing with value. Thank you, Anthony. So as we round third base, we wrap things up, we take it home. Is there anything else you'd like our fans to know? Anything at all? Maybe how to reach out, how to contact you, anything at all? Yeah, we run a, a free weekly and uh, a monthly newsletter on LinkedIn. So please uh, follow the economy page on LinkedIn where we go through a lot of the, the technical events that are taking place in the market, the macro side of things as well. Completely free. We're just trying to provide as much education and value around the digital asset market uh, and how to build an, uh, an investment portfolio in the space as well. And that's economy, I-C-O-N-M-Y or M-I? Uh, yeah, I-C-O-N-O-M-I. There you go. There it is. So go to LinkedIn. You can follow that newsletter and really help to drill in. So just to summarize everything, folks, Bitcoin, remember, one competitive advantage you can have is Bitcoin is best observed as a hedge against M2 money supply. The second thing that Anthony mentioned was the trend is your friend. Follow trend lines, not headlines. Make sure that you follow the data. Be very disciplined in your approach. And then finally, follow the DXY to BTC technical chart. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. Wow, what a show. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.